Is the devil real? Whether you believe or not, there are those who seek to commune with the dark power of evil. I can't give you an exact figure, but satanic rituals and cults certainly do exist, and from what I understand, they may also be on the rise. Sean Seaback and his friend Joe are about to find out some things are better left to the imagination. The things aren't always what they seem, I suppose, and maybe sometimes the cookie cutter places can be some of the most strange and dangerous. The story is kind of the um, coming of age story. Growing up in a small town surrounded by forest, there really isn't much for a kid to do, except maybe get into trouble. It's just a typical, you know, American small town. I think the population at the time was just over 200 people. So it, a very small town indeed. But such places are full of dark secrets. You start to hear stories from the elder classmen, so to speak. The guys in leather jackets who smoke cigarettes and, and drink beer. So you guys think you're pretty cool, huh? I bet you're not tough enough to go up to the old Girl Scouts camp. Why would we go to the old Girl Scouts camp? There's devil worshippers up there doing sacrifices. Well, first, when we heard about the abandoned campsite, we just thought that it was them trying to scare us and spook us, jerking around, trying to have fun with us. You've been? Yeah, I've been. <laughs> we'll, we'll go. And we'll get proof. To be honest, I think that there was a part of us that wanted to go back there and prove our worth. Proof to not only the older kids, but to ourselves as well, that we're courageous enough to face this. And if we can get proof, even better, and then we'll have something to show the other kids in this town. Maybe you shouldn't take on every dare, especially when it comes to satanic cults. Well, cults by definition, or historically, they are very secretive and they don't want that their secrets revealed to the rest of society. We chose Friday the 13th on purpose. I mean, it's Friday the 13th. When you're younger, that's, that's a big deal. But we didn't tell our parents at all, absolutely not. We had no idea what we were going to find and nobody knew that we were going back there. Just got into his car and uh, drove there that night. We took a drive, a long drive around some back country roads just to kind of make sure that we wanted to do this. The longer we drove, the more we got ourselves psyched up and the more real it felt and, and became. And then the question kind of fell upon us like, well, what if they really are back there? Perhaps what's most disturbing after one finds a small cult satanic cult within your small town, your next thought may be, who else in the town, who do I know, may be part of that cult. We needed proof that we actually saw something, so we decided to bring a disposable camera with a flash with us. This was before the days, of course, of, you know, cell phones and, and all that. This camp has been deserted for decades. Sean and Joe have to leave the car behind and hike almost a mile to get to the woods. Completely ignore the no trespassing sign. What are we doing? Oh, this is so stupid. <laughs> Thank you. 
Even though the camp is abandoned, the friends get the sense they aren't alone. Once we started on foot and as we approached the forest, we were walking very slowly, tiptoe-ish so we wouldn't be seen. That's when we started to hear tribal drums. Did you hear those drums? Yes. Okay, come on. Why? Maybe heading deeper into the woods is not a good idea. At least not without weapons. The question is, where do they find them? The boys luck out and stumble upon the defenses they need. There was like a tire iron, there was, uh, I think maybe a baseball bat. My palms were sweaty, my heart was racing, the adrenaline was just pumping through my body. It kind of seemed like a dream as we started to approach the actual entrance to the woods. They may be armed, but that doesn't mean they're ready for what's out here. Friday the 13th, Sean and Joe head to an abandoned Girl Scouts camp in search of a satanic cult, rumored to conduct rituals here. And as they get closer, they start to suspect something evil is lurking in the woods. Well, cults by definition, or historically, they are very secretive, and should any member of uh, society outside of the cult stumble across uh, one of their rituals, and there would be a consequence to that. The woods are very thick, the trees are very tall, and there's like an entrance to the forest, but where the trees start, they kind of branch over each other, creating like this, this weird tunnel. It's really cool and fascinating, but really kind of creepy at the same time when you're back there at night and you see the moon. As the boys near the source of the drumming, their fear grows stronger. It was kind of like an out-of-body experience, I guess I could say. It, it didn't seem real, it seemed like a dream. That's when we started to hear a woman screaming. I've never heard any woman ever shriek like that except for in the movies, when they're being chased by somebody in a mask. Then we saw torches bobbing up and down, going across the trail. It all happened really fast, and it was really just a rush of excitement and fright. Sean and Joe find a hidden vantage point and finally catch a glimpse of what outsiders are forbidden to see. There was a statue of the Virgin Mary, a decapitated deer head sitting on top of it where her face would be. And there was dinner cutlery stuck throughout the statue, like dinner forks, dinner knives, and there was like blood running down the statue. Yeah. Yeah. 
and in our minds, we, we, we thought maybe she's being sacrificed to Satan, something like that. My first thought when I saw all of that was, this is absolutely 100% real. What have we gotten ourselves into? It's not just the cult they have to worry about, but also what horrors they may summon. What can come out of a satanic ritual, the conjuring of a, a, a figure representing Satan or the devil or an evil energy, uh, will be the end the end game and how that energy is used afterwards is anybody's guess yet there is an even greater danger these kids face getting caught hey! Sean and Joe went looking for devil worshippers on a dare. Now their mission to find a satanic cult has led them down a dark and dangerous path. If this cult did manage to conjure uh, uh, an entity or a physical being uh, through their, their ritual, that would probably scar the, the minds of the kids who witnessed it in the first place and their worlds will undoubtedly be turned upside down. They want to return with proof of what they've seen. I gotta get a picture of this. Before the photo can be snapped, they are caught seeing what outsiders hey! are not supposed to witness. They spotted us. They must have seen the flashlight. If you're ever in a situation where you're being chased by a large predatory animal, that's the only way that I can describe the way I felt. It must feel like being chased by a lion. We just booked it. The last thing they want is to be captured by people who worship Satan. Consequences can range from a stern, a scary warning to a punishment by death, and not just of the witness, but to their family, to, to their loved ones. We got in the car, we dove in, and we peeled out of there. It was frightening and exhilarating, and we were just kind of like, holy shit, what was that? They've escaped with their lives, but not with the proof they need. What the hell? We have to go back and get a picture. Nobody is going to believe us. Fine. It was not my idea to turn back, but I was all for it. I think at that moment, we're brothers in arms, and we decided to just go back there and do it together. That was a bad idea. They discover their return has been anticipated. We never got the photo. Our intention, 100%, was to just get in and get out as fast as possible and snap as many pictures as, as we could. That is not what happened. When we saw those headlights, we said, oh, shit. The passenger door swings open. And this real squirrely guy comes out and just immediately runs toward the car. Why did we come back? This was a stupid idea. Hey! His eyes are bloodshot red, and he's just, he, he's going crazy. What do you think you're doing here? Smacking the driver's side window and just starts beating on the windshield with his hands. Ah! What are you doing here? Cussing, swearing, up and down. Hello? Threatening us, telling us that we made the biggest mistake of our lives. 
So we just see this large silhouette of a man slowly walk, very calm. Hey! The driver, because he's very tall, he had broad shoulders. He also had a beard, blue jeans, just the typical blue collar type of guy in a small town. What are you doing here? We were just, um, we were looking for a party. We got lost, we're just looking for a place to turn the car around. Uh-huh, sure. You got ID? Yeah. Give it here. Joe, don't give him his license. He's gonna know where you live. He's gonna get your address. Da -da 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 -da. And Joe, you know, he takes out his wallet, flipped it through the window. And so I'm like, no, what are you doing? Don't do that, don't do that. Get out of here. Consider this a warning. You come back, I've got my shotgun ready. It all sends a message that you don't mess with us. You don't mess with what we believe in and what we're trying to do. My friend said, didn't this used to be an old Girl Scout camp? Without missing a beat, the driver, the big tall guy said, Girl Scouts? Boy, there hasn't been Girl Scouts running through these woods in years. That's all been taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> we absolutely knew that it had to have been part of the cult. How else would those guys, I mean, it's too coincidental for two random um, hillbillies to just drive back there on a whim in the middle of the night. Their, their eyes were just staring at us all, all the way back. And we, uh, we drove forward and never looked back. After tonight, it's impossible for Sean to look at his town the same way again. Once we found out that there was indeed a cult back there, it did make me look at things in a different light. To know that those people weren't just from out of town, that they actually could possibly be our neighbors, it was pretty scary. Sean and Joe now understand that you don't mess with devil worshippers let alone the devil himself. But many still haven't learned that lesson. <laughs> Zack and his friends are about to experience what can happen when you call forth the Dark Lord. Sean and Joe risk their lives seeking out a satanic cult. Consider this a warning. You come back, I've got my shotgun ready. But that's nothing compared to what happens when you engage with the Dark One himself. Locals call this the Devil's Turning Point. It's a piece of dead land in an isolated forest. The air is thick with decay. Very little manages to grow here. Paranormal investigator Peter Rowe has studied the legend. The Devil's Turning Point. It's an area of cleared land uh, in the middle of this naked forest in Chatham County, North Carolina. And a legend has grown since 1903. They say Satan prowls this spot in the dead of night, ever since mankind ushered him forth. Because of its sinister reputation, the clearing has been the site of many satanic rituals. That has opened the door for evil to come and stay. Our best guess is that at some point in the not too distant past, a ritual has taken place in this area and it may have created what's known as a portal for demonic entities to come through from one realm into our reality. People avoid this place like the plague, but every now and then, someone comes looking for trouble. Everything that's happened was definitely like an omen to, to stay away from this place. Zach, his girlfriend Lisa, and friends Colby and Tyler went out in search of a thrill. None of them was willing to go on camera to share their story. But Peter Rowe is very familiar with their case. Well, Zach was a local resident who had obviously heard of this legend and wanted to see if the devil does indeed show up at the devil's turning point. This was a very dangerous experiment to try, even with three or four people. It was very, very, very risky. Right. 
So when Zach and his friends arrived, they noticed a white cross was painted nearby, just outside the clearing. <laughs> Come on, guys. It's just a bunch of lines. Okay. Now, the cross could have meant one of two things, either safety for anyone who were, was about to enter the clearing, or it could have been a symbol that was keeping whatever was in the clearing from leaving the clearing and keeping it caged. If anything weird happens, and come back here. I think this is a safe spot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Zach's good friend Colby came along as a skeptic. He didn't believe in the legend at all, thought it was all garbage, and wanted to be there to prove that to his friends. But the rest of the gang believes the legend is real, and they want to get proof that the devil walks this land. So Zach and his crew brought along a couple pieces of equipment, a digital camera and video camera as well, and hopefully capture some sort of phenomenon that they could take back with them to show the world that, yes, the devil does indeed visit the devil's turning point. Colby brings his own test for the fabled turning point, a sapling. into these places like it's hard it's you definitely have to keep an awareness messing with these things even no matter how experienced you are can get out of control oh jeez so the group very tentatively stepped into the the clearing this is it. This is cold. Yeah. It's a bunch of dirt, guys. Ooh, it's spooky. Take this. Ah. I can start a fire up here. Yeah, it's freezing. Hey, Zach, tell us about what you're doing. Uh, well, we're starting a fire before it gets too dark. We're gonna try and see the devil. Well, apparently, he roams these lands. <laughs> I think we'll see Tyler pee his pants if we're lucky enough. <laughs> Dude, shut up. I'm trying to make a fire over here. Colby had a bit of a jerk streak in him, and wanted to use this opportunity to mess with his friends and have a bit of fun for his own sake. Yo, what's that? Oh, well, you know, you said that nothing could grow here. I want to prove them wrong. What if it sprouts a tree demon? Whatever, man, you're the one that believes in demons, not me. Dude, why'd you even come if you're gonna be such a buzzkill? I'm not being a buzzkill. Grow, save the planet, prove you guys wrong that demons exist. That's the spirit, thanks for that. Yeah, no problem. Colby, was that letter you gave me earlier empty? No, man. I just bought that at the gas station. It should be full. It's not working. The group soon realizes something is preventing them from building a fire. Yeah. Just won't start. Lisa was already feeling nervous going into this, but once inside, she reported feeling that they were being watched from the perimeter of the circle. I don't think we're alone. People may also feel like they're being watched or that there's just kind of a, a shiver sort of behind them. Let's take a look! Oh, God! It's such a bad toy, you know, I got that on tape. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. <laughs> Tyler and Colby and Zach and Lisa decided to split up me up with you boys in a second. All right. And it turns out that that wasn't a very good idea at all. All right. We've braved our way through the woods all by ourselves. <laughs> hey, do you back there, Lise? Um, I feel a little weird, actually. Oh, 
Oh, that's kind of creepy. Yeah, man. <laughs> Their search leads to something highly disturbing. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's not funny! There were several paintings and images carved into the tree line just outside the perimeter that were very creepy. What is this? <laughs> Let's get out of here, yo. <laughs> Let's just go back to camp, please. Come on. I'm coming. So as Zach and Lisa explore their side of the clearing, Lisa feels a push from behind. and this freaked her out. They are definitely not alone in the woods tonight, and the devil has plans for them. I think something wanted to be found out there. Zack, Lisa, Colby, and Tyler head out to a site where satanic rituals have opened a door for the devil to walk through. There are a lot of different types of things going on behind the scene as far as evil rituals, as far as cults, as far as people summoning some of the darker energies that are out there. And now the group has a sense that evil is here with them. What? Why did you push me? Babe, I didn't touch you. An unseen force has nearly knocked Lisa over. Something is out here, Zach, I swear. And this prompts her to pull out her digital camera and start taking photos of the area immediately. Let's go. Wait, 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 wait a second. Wait something. Um... The flash seems to bounce back at them as if it had hit a wall along the perimeter of this clearing. This suggests to me that there may have been some sort of a, a border or a wall of some kind that reflected the light. Look at this. What is that? And when Lisa looked down at her camera screen, she noticed that there were several orbs flitting about each of her pictures. They began to think that perhaps there really was something to the legend after all. all right, let's go back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good call. Wait for me. Zach and Lisa turn back and head towards the clearing. They start to see shadow figures up ahead of them through the trees and voices as well that they figure are Tyler and Colby's voices. They see the clearing up ahead. Through the trees, they see a shadow pacing around. But when they reach the clearing, they're not there. Tensions were pretty high at this point, when suddenly Zach felt a hand on his shoulder. Oh my God! Oh my God! Funny, Colby! Thanks, Colby. <laughs> Colby was having a grand old time at his friend's expense. It's getting too dark. It's freezing. Oh, we're not staying here all night, are we? Of course we are. This is funny. Yeah, you guys don't actually is. believe in this nonsense, do you? Despite strong apprehension, they decide to camp out for the night. The longer they stayed there, the stranger things got. And a sense of dread was palpable. Yo, so I was trying to light this. It wasn't lighting. It's a new lighter, isn't it? Yeah, Colby just got it. Something is still preventing them from building a fire. And now, more trouble. Hmm? 
Hey man, what's going on? Zach started to feel sick to his stomach. <laughs> Zach, get up! <laughs> oh, Zach, my stomach! And Tyler, concerned for his friend, started toward him. <laughs> Tyler, Tyler! As he was moving to Zach, he suddenly fell flat on his face and broke his nose. Blood splattered everywhere. Tyler. Come on, man. Jeez. Come here. Come here. Uh. Scott! Ah! Wake up! Because Tyler had dropped his flashlight inside the clearing, Zach returned to retrieve it, and as he did, he felt a burning sensation on his lower leg. Uh, you're okay, man. <laughs> Zach immediately rolled up his pant leg, and by the light of the flashlight, everyone could see what looked like bite marks forming in red on his leg. I have no explanation for bite marks of this nature. These are not unheard of in areas of paranormal activity where demonic entities or even Satan is reputed to be present. Oh no! I don't want to do this anymore. Let's go. Come on guys, let's go. At this point, Lisa is absolutely freaking out and she wanted to leave. Fear is what is used to control people. It happens a lot more than we really know about. Man, are you kidding me? Are you actually kidding me right now? There's nothing here, guys! Look at his legs! Colby had a different reaction. The devil does not exist! There's something here! He started to get more angry, and the skeptic in him also came out, and he decided to use a bit of provocation. Hello, devil! Hold on, hello! Hail Satan, are you out there? Hmm, no! There's no devil here! Calling out the devil, asking him to show itself. Everybody else thought that was a bad idea, and in most cases, that is a bad idea. Hello, devil! Oh, stop messing around, man! It's not funny! Guys, look what? at this. What? Colby? Lisa took another photo of him, and when she looked at her screen, she noticed a bright light seemed or appeared to be entering Colby's body at the same time. Get out! And then, then that's when Colby started to change. Colby, Colby, you okay? Colby, Colby! Get out! God! Get out! Get out! And he began speaking in tongues, languages that he wouldn't have known and his friends have never heard him speak before. It would seem that Colby, by provoking the devil or calling it out, got his wish. Zack and his friends went to a clearing in the woods where the devil is said to prowl. Zack's friend Colby called out the Dark One. Hello, devil! And it came for him. Colby employed provocation, which is never a good idea. Get out, Colby! Hello? Colby, Hello? stop! Colby! Now evil has Colby in its clutches. Guys? What? And he's turned on his friends. Colby! Get out! Get out! You just don't know what's there, and challenging it on its own turf is never a good idea. At this point, Colby's eyes snapped open, and they were no longer his. They were glowing red. Possession is the phenomenon where we have our body and our mind and our soul all occupying one space. Another being actually moves into our physical body space with our soul still being there. 
and amazingly, Colby began to levitate about two feet into the air. Tyler rushed over to help Colby. Both fell to the ground. Tyler was now affected, writhing, screaming in agony as if he were being ripped apart by an animal. Ah! Get Tyler! Ah! Get him! Lisa, his back's bleeding. Zack and Lisa pulled Tyler to safety outside of the clearing. The word hell has been scratched into his back as if something with a claw had etched it there. I want to go. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Get guys. him back to the car. Tyler still had enough energy to help Zack and Lisa drag Colby back out of the clearing. Colby is pulled past the sampling he planted mere hours ago, and it's already dead. Luckily, that's not Colby's fate. And almost as suddenly as it began, Colby seemed to return to a normal state. <laughs> they passed the white cross that they'd passed on the way in. The group hopes reaching the white cross means they are finally safe. This didn't turn out to be the case. Oh my god! Oh my god, what is that? Lisa looked up down the road. A black, tall, thin figure of a man was standing watching the group. Seeing this ominous black figure watching them from just up the road was the final straw. And the four of them tumbled into the car, and the car would not start. Please hurry! Just please hurry! Just please hurry. Last time the friends spot the figure, it's but a few yards away from the car, and that's when the car started. And they tore out of there as fast as they could. Go, 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 go. Five or six miles down the road, Zach pulls the car over so that everyone can get out and have a breather and reflect on what had just happened. But there is no evading the devil. This time there was no stopping the car and Zack drove everyone to the safety of their own homes. Zack, Tyler, Lisa, and Colby have never been back. Even though they escaped that night, the ordeal doesn't end. After that eventful evening, strange things happened to all four of the friends for months. And all four of them have experienced visions of the thin, dark man in their own homes. And now, Seth... His wife and her nephew have invited John Amon along for a weekend getaway into the woods, not knowing the danger that awaits them. I think some entities or ghosts, spirit people, creatures, they prefer the wilderness as opposed to a more urban setting. They prefer the, the sense of solitude. My friend. Seth just asked me if I wanted to go camping with him and his wife at the time. I usually hung out with Seth at his house drinking and watching games. His wife had a brother who was in jail and had a kid named Owen. I had met Owen a couple times and I liked him. And he liked to hang out with me. I liked to make him laugh. Hey Owen, you forgot your bag! Can I eat these? 
Uh, no, I doubt it. Um, they don't taste very good and they'll probably kill you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but they soon discover their road trip has led them to the middle of nowhere. And they are not welcome. John Amon decides to tag along on a camping trip with his friend Seth, Seth's wife, and her nephew Owen. But they've gone further off the trail than they should have. And they are not alone. The likelihood of entities being attracted to a vacationer in the wilderness at a cabin or a campground, say, it's likely because that is their home turf. They are territorial. This is the place. Let's start setting up. I'd been in the military and uh, Boy Scouts when I was younger, so I was showing them how to build a campfire. So we want to set it up with a teepee like this. So. Yeah. He was enjoying himself. Uh, we're gonna need some more wood. Race you! Hey, oh, be careful, buddy. But running off into this uncharted forest is not a good idea. Don't worry, I got him. Owen! Oh. Hey, wait for me! He ran up to the top of the hill. I told him not to go over the hill. Owen doesn't listen. Maybe he should have. Owen! And he can't go too far because he's little. Owen! We had uh, trails that weren't too worn down and the woods were um, partially uh, old growth. Thicker than what you normally have. This isn't funny! You could tell that people usually didn't go up there. Owen! 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 Come on! This isn't a joke! Owen! Fearing the child is lost, John returns to the campsite to give his friends the bad news. I, I lost Owen, I don't know where he is. Owen comes right back screaming. <laughs> oh my God, Owen! And we didn't know what was going on because he was crying and screaming. Oh, hey! Jumped in Seth's arms and we were trying to figure out what was going on. Hey, hey, what's wrong? You okay? When he finally started getting out the words, we couldn't understand him. It's okay, you can tell us. And then we kept hearing Vamp. A, a, a vampire! I saw a vampire over there! Vampire is a being who insists on feeding off the living. Are you sure that's what you saw? There was a vampire over there, and we're like, there's not a vampire over there. Are you sure? Especially since, according to legend, vampires only come out at night. Maybe it was just the shadows, you know? We thought he had an active imagination or uh, saw something, and his imagination made him think it was something else. You know what? We could go take a look. Yeah, let's go take a look. No! Yeah. No! Let's go take no. a look. Oh, here, look, come on. It's not, there's nothing to be afraid of. Come on. Come on, it's okay. I'll show you. Look, see? Nothing here. Yeah. Hello. John and Seth take Owen back to the spot where he claims he saw the creature. 
It's often been speculated that vampires are, are not so much humans, but creatures. If they are a dying race, uh, you know, it would make sense, like the Bigfoot, for them to hide in remote areas to preserve their race, to continue living. We went and looked, and we didn't see anybody. See? See, look. As a group, trying not to laugh at them, trying to be serious about it, and telling them, see, there's nothing over there. It's just your imagination, you know? And he was adamant that he had seen a vampire. We had no idea what was going on with him. Just because they can't see it, doesn't mean it's not there. Now, night is falling. Despite Owen's fear, they stick to their plans to camp overnight, though it may be unwise. Entities are assumed to be drawn to campsites for the remoteness. Most entities will prefer the wilderness over populated areas. It would make sense for the vampire to be territorial as well. We had built a campfire. We were having a pretty good time. Everyone, that is, except Owen. He is scared and miserable. We were making s'mores and roasting marshmallows with Owen, trying to have him have a good time. Do you want a s'more? I want to go home. Yeah, maybe you should take him home. John and I can stay behind and clean up. We'll follow. Sure. Ready to go? Owen oh, left with uh, Seth's wife. Seth and I had packed up. We start going down the trail and we get to the main asphalt road and start driving. What? Did you see that? See what? That the, the guy in the cape. He's like, there's a guy standing at the side of the road in a in a cape. I started laughing at him. I'm like, yeah, right. And there's nobody at the side of the road in a cape. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm telling you. Okay, dude, you're seeing things, man. No, I know what I saw. I'm, okay. I'm... Seth's kind of like, if you don't believe him, he's got to prove that uh, something happened. Look, fine, fine, fine. I'll prove it to you. Prove it. Turning back is not a good idea. Ooh, scary. <laughs> Shut up. Why would anybody be at the side of the road in a cape? No one here but us vampires. <laughs> I'll pretty sarcastic when we turned around there was nothing there at first I'm like oh wow look at this there's a whole lot of nothing out here <laughs> trying to get him a little pissed off making fun of him I don't see anything he wasn't saying anything I pretty much pissed him off by that point we're looking around and when we turn back around he was standing there let's go now when I saw him, I couldn't believe my eyes. John Eamon heads out on a road trip with his friends and their nephew. But the adventure is cut short when the boy thinks he sees a vampire. I saw a vampire over there! And now, John and Seth are alone on a deserted road. Whoa, what the hell? Facing the terrifying creature. He was standing there in like a Victorian style coat and uh, head was shaking back and forth rapidly. And we just stare at him for a while, not believing what we're seeing. And Seth and I don't talk to each other. We're just staring at this guy, he's shaking his head. To so imagine a vampire who has a thirst for blood. 
and you are in an environment in the middle of nowhere and you encounter one of these, that is a very dangerous situation. Just stand there, his head's just shaking back and forth really fast. After a couple seconds, I tell Seth, uh, I think we should go. I think we need to go now. And all of a sudden he stops and he just starts looking at us and grinning. A very uneasy feeling that he was giving off. He was just looking at us through the top of his eyes and just kind of grinning. So we could see as deep as like he was a uh, predator and we were the prey, like he was going to come after us. As soon as I say that, this guy starts taking off and starts chasing right at us. Get it! Unfortunately, Seth, instead of fixing his engines, he likes to throw an old engine in there. Seth hits the gas. And we were trying to get, get out of it. Somebody. I'm going to spreading. No matter how fast they drive, they can't seem to escape. And it seemed like it was easy for him to keep up. Come on, man. He wasn't panting or anything. He was just grinning at us the whole time. Seth starts going about 45, 50. Go. He was keeping up the whole time. <laughs> hey, come on. Go, go, go. He's still there. He's still there. According to legend, uh, these creatures are strong. They're fast. They can phase. They can disappear and reappear instantly. Come on! There's no way! I look behind the uh, Jeep and I don't see anybody. I see there? Seth's trying to drive and look around. He doesn't see him. I can't see him! No! Seth's like, where are you going? We don't see him anywhere. Did you see that? I... Next thing I know, I see the guy running right up the next side of the Jeep, right next to Seth. I start screaming, you, we need to go, we need to go. And this guy, he's not even panting. He's just running alongside the Jeep, staring with the same stare that he stared at us from the woods. And Seth looks and he screams. And he's still hitting the gas. And we're finally getting some acceleration going. We're screaming our heads off. I'm glad he's not on my side. I look and I'm like, where did he go? And Seth looks at me and says, I don't know where he went. Where did he go? Owen said he saw a vampire. Well, I'm going to assume that he saw the guy wearing the uh, cape out there in the middle of the woods. I had, don't know what Owen saw, but I know what we saw. Let's go now! John and Seth's road trip is a horrifying experience. I haven't seen anything like that before, or ever. <laughs> and now, two brothers, Keegan and Colin Cool, are headed out for a drive down another isolated road and into a rendezvous with terror. This stretch through the outskirts of Kiowa, Colorado has a dark history. A teenage girl lost her life here. In 1997, a bunch of teens rolled their car and one died on the spot. They say the ghost of the girl haunts the road. Keegan and Colin have come to see for themselves. If you go poking around in, into something you do not understand, expect to have negative effects. You don't know what you're getting to without proper research and planning, uh, I do not recommend you going in and investigate anything without fully understanding what it is that's going on. I can't even explain what it was. It was just a weird kind of... Feels weird out here. ...experience for me. Ghost Road is haunted. That is not what people expect. What the hell was that? We do not understand how paranormal works. Uh, we do have a lot of information that it exists. It could be dangerous, extremely dangerous. We don't know. Uh, at any given second, it could turn. 
It could be violent. Decades ago, a road trip took the life of a teenage girl. Brothers Colin and Keegan are taking a drive to see if her ghost haunts the place where she died. There's a, an older theory that suggests that certain energies, emotions are imprinted on the environment. And when the right person comes along among the living, their brain somehow tunes into that recording, if you will, that plays over and over and over again in the environment. It's just farmland, nothing else. It's just dirt road and there's nothing around there. That feeling I got that day, it was more of me being tense, kind of shaky. It was still in the chest and I can't, it was more constricting and it's, it's really hard to explain. such a strong sadness uh, that I felt was backed up by this cross. We were actually looking at a place where someone died. According to studies, most of the hauntings are geared around the areas where the deaths have happened. Not only is the spirit of the teenage girl stalking this road, it's said the ghost of what killed her roams here too. You feel this overwhelming sense of sadness, and you don't know if maybe the spirit's projecting that onto you, or if you're just emotionally tied into the scenario of a young person being killed at that very spot that you're at. You hear that? We actually heard a, a girl scream. And so we kind of jumped and looked, but there was no one else there. was that? You could feel more of a heaviness in the air. You feel that? And so it went from being a sadness more to kind of like an eerie, you're kind of just waiting, feeling like something's going to happen. We started noticing the atmosphere start to change. something out here that's when we started hearing this like sound and it sounded really close and you look to your right you look to your left nothing you look behind you nothing so you're like all right I, I hear it but I don't see it that sound just grew louder and louder. All of a sudden you see this truck and we're like, how did that get there? How did we not notice it coming up, you know? We started just kind of staring at this and the inside cab light was completely on but there was no one driving it. This is the truck that struck and killed the teenage girl. Now, it's coming for Colin and Keegan. Felt like it wanted us to go to it, like it was kind of beckoning at us. It's trying to like kill us. Is it trying to gather more souls or something like that? We had nothing to protect us. We were in the middle of nowhere. Phones weren't working, nothing. We were stunned. As terrified as they are, they are unable to move. It's as though they are entranced. I was petrified from fear. 
are going to die. And it slowly drove up. It was slowing down, slowing down to a crawl. It was moving closer and closer. And all of a sudden, it was just gone. Keegan and Colin have no idea what the truck was doing there that night, but it's enough to deter them from ever returning to the area. Let's get out of here. Yeah. It hurts your insides just thinking about it. I've actually thrown up because it's so dark and it just, it hurts your stomach. November 5th, 1975, I marked time by that, you know? It marked the end of my life as I knew it and the beginning of life as I have been forced to accept it. I realize that I can't escape it. The highest point of this remote forest sits at 7,000 feet above sea level and is known as the Mogollon Rim. Loggers have worked the area for many years and have stories to tell of strange beings that stalk this land. A lot of other people had seen things. I had heard stories uh, from other loggers of creatures. They called it the Mogollon Monster, named after the Mogollon Rim area. This guy was with a crew. Uh, he looked over and he saw this creature uh, rise up from behind the log, look right at him. It turned and walked away. And he was adamant that what he'd seen was no other animal you would encounter in these woods. There were stories in the newspaper about cattle mutilation, ritualistic looking, they called them mutilations, uh, operations, whatever, on, on uh, livestock. The oldest mutilation uh, recorded was in the 1600s. There was a uh, hundred sheep that were mysteriously had their innards removed without any flaw to their skin or their fleece. Based on descriptions told by multiple accounts, it, it appears as if experimentation is going on. But I, you know, there's no way to determine whether that's good or bad. Tonight, Travis Walton and his crew are driving down an old logging road, heading home after a long day of work on the fabled rim. It's hard, sweaty, dirty work, and you really want to hit the shower at the end of the day. Oh, well, no, thank you. Come on. Yeah. So, so. I'd known some of these other loggers on the crew, and we'd worked together in the past, but some of them I hardly knew at all. Think the boss will be happy? He never is. Oh, man, he better be. <laughs> The road we were driving on was really rough and, you know, it was just a more of a track than a road and you'd really have to slow down and pick your way across it just to keep from scraping the underside of the truck. We were 15 miles from the nearest town, uh, pretty close to the border of the Apache Indian Reservation. Travis senses they're not the only ones on this deserted road. Hey, you guys see that? What the heck is that? It's all the world. The first thing I recall seeing was just some little glimmers of light through the trees. You just normally don't encounter any kind of light uh, in the forest at night. It's, it's usually pretty pitch black. You think uh, you can wear a plane went down or a plane? Wow. It was such a remote area that to even encounter another vehicle was not that common. It wasn't fitting in with any of the casual explanations that, you know, immediately came to mind. 
Could this be the sun going down? No, that's the sun it set a long time ago. Could this be the moon? No, the moon's over here. Could this be, you know, somebody camping there, deer season or whatever? But the light was coming from higher than where ground level would be. The closer we got, there was a break in the trees ahead to where some of this light was shining across the road. What is that? I have no idea. It's not a plane. What is it? <laughs> I don't know. It was definitely a, a, a curiosity where, you know, we're prepared for about anything because it was just, it was definitely something out of the ordinary. Travis. Travis, what are you, Travis, what are you doing? Come on, man. Travis. Travis. Okay, I'm fine, Mike. Leave me alone. My action was pretty alarming to the to the rest of the crew. What is he doing? Travis! Travis, come on! God damn it. Travis! Travis, get back here! Come on, man, get back to the truck! I was just awestruck. Just astonished. It was just sort of a frightening and, and beautiful at the same time. The closer I got, the more I became aware of the sound it was making. Travis! Come on! It was a really strange mixture of uh, really high and really low tones that went off the range of human hearing on, on the high and the low end. Something's not right, man. You gotta get back to the truck. I had a slowly growing awareness of the of the danger I was in. It was a clearly defined metallic, shiny object giving off light and energy, and it was a very imposing sight, and uh, no doubt about it, this is a spaceship. The same thing that draws aliens to our planet is the same thing that draws us to others. Exploration, curiosity, sustainability of life, that's why we go. It would make sense as to why they're visiting here. Travis! Quit playing around, man. Get back here. The crew were swearing at me, uh, calling me crazy, you know, telling me to get back in the truck. And, uh, I wish I had. <laughs> What happened next was so unexpected. It's been theorized that aliens prefer remote areas because they don't want to attract attention. Whatever it is that they're doing, they would want to do that in a less populated area. Travis Walton and his co-workers are driving down a deserted logging road. I don't like this, man. Just keep driving. What? what? when he feels compelled to leave them and walk towards a mysterious light. Come on, man. Travis, come on, man. This was the quintessential disc shape. Uh, uh, two pipe hands put lip to lip, uh, the dome on top. A um, saucer shape. What do we do? Travis! They call on to me to get back in the truck in using some rather colorful language. Come on, man, get back to the truck! I was just taking this in with astonishment. But you know, the crew guys, they said it looked to them like I was under outside control. Don't get closer, man, come on! 
there's something in common with all these experiencers and there's a reason why they're selected there's a reason why they're lured oh god travis travis come on hurry get back here this thing was giving off light but the surface itself was like glass like it was all one surface The sound was so high that when you turn your head, you can't really be sure of the direction it's coming from. And the low end was, was something you like feeling your body as, as much as here with your ear. It suddenly got louder. I just dove for cover. And I jumped into a crouch behind this log. Travis! And the crew was Travis! yelling, uh, swearing at me to get back in the truck uh, because they wanted to just get the hell out of there. And I, you know, I was beginning to share that feeling. It's not fine, man. Get back to the car. And I quickly decided to run for the truck. Travis, come on, hurry! Get back here! So when I stood up, that triggered some kind of a discharge. <laughs> Whatever it was, there was a blast of energy that came out of the bottom of that craft. It felt like, kind of like uh, I'd been hit, if you've ever been tackled and blindsided when you didn't see it coming. At the same time, feeling quite a bit like uh, an electric shock. It was so violent, the, the crew compared it to stepping on a landmine or a grenade, because it threw me through the air. Some of them said 10 feet, some of them said 20 feet. But when my body hit the ground, they said there was no evidence that I was trying to break my fall or anything. They said it was like a sack of meat, like there wasn't a bone in my body when I hit the ground. And the guy said they could feel the vibration in the truck. They were certain it had killed me. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. The last thing I remember was this sense of brightness, but it was almost immediately I was unconscious. A numbing sort of a shock, a stunning sort of a feeling. Very powerful. Fearing for their lives, Travis's co-workers hightail it out of there as fast as they can. I think the crew was did the smartest thing. If they saw somebody get killed, why should they risk their lives to save somebody they believe is already dead? I mean, uh, it was so violent and so obvious to them that it had killed me that um, I don't blame them for taking off. They are the lucky ones. For Travis, the horror is only just beginning. Compelled to investigate a UFO in the remote forest, Travis Walton ignores his friend's pleas to return to the truck and pays the price. The intensity of the fear that I was experiencing right before I was hit, you know, did have me really thinking uh, just about how foolish what I had done really was. I didn't really have uh, time to reflect on the uh, implications of uh, what was happening. Travis! 
He's dead. He's dead. No. He's dead. He's dead. He's dead. His colleagues barely escaped the same fate. When the crew got a little better grip on themselves, they were really, you know, having a really frantic discussion about what to do. You gotta go back. You gotta go back from. Mike said to the crew, look, we gotta go back, and they were gonna stay together, and so they all went back. His greatest fear was what my body was going to look like because of the violence of that blast. Was I even going to be in one piece? It was such a powerful thing. Travis! Travis! My footprints, footprints. They were able to uh, locate the spot. Travis! Mike could see where my footprints had gone up towards this craft. So they knew they were in the right spot, but they yelled with the hope that maybe I would just, uh, you know, have been nearby and maybe, you know, recovered from being stunned and could, uh, you know, come to their calls. But that, that, uh, wasn't happening. Oh. Travis! Mike was sort of overcome with uh, the emotional impact of the whole thing. Travis! Probably some guilt at having taken off like that. They debated whether to go to the authorities. And uh, some of them did not want to involve the authorities because uh, they felt like nobody's going to believe this is incredible. Nobody's going to believe this. They have no idea just how far away Travis actually is. first regained consciousness, I was in a lot of pain. I was, I was disoriented. I, I really didn't know where I was. I was on a raised surface because the ceiling was close to me. But even though there was a light there, it wasn't all that bright, it, it hurt to open my eyes and, and look at the light. vision was blurry and I felt above all like I was suffocating I, cu I couldn't breathe I kept breathing hard and it, and it hurt I felt something was very wrong inside I felt mortally wounded in a serious serious way like something's wrong here and I couldn't focus my eyes it was almost like double vision very blurry And I could hear the sounds of movement around me. And I just thought, well, he took me to the hospital and, you know, these are the doctors. Doctor. But he quickly realizes he is not in a hospital. Uh, hello. I knew there was something lying across my chest. I could hardly move. This suffocating feeling, I think, was most of where the, the panic came from. Please. The pain and the feeling of suffocation. I could make out the faces of what I thought were the doctors, but when I could finally focus, I could see I was looking into the face of this creature. And boom, I knew where I was in. I was taken aboard the spaceship. Get away from me! That just freaked me out. 
I just uh, instantly had a shot of adrenaline that, <laughs> that brought me the rest of the way awake. And I was in fight or flight kind of a mode. I was in total panic, total hysteria. Travis. Travis left his colleagues in their truck and walked towards a spaceship. There are multiple accounts of the same thing from people from all over the world. People that do not know each other, do not live in the same cultures, and they're all looking up, they're all seeing things in the sky. So it would be naive of us to think that we're alone in the universe. Now, he has been abducted and is surrounded by aliens. Help! The feeling of feeling trapped, the feeling of unknown in terms of what's going to happen to me. Am I dying? You know, what are these creatures going to do to me? No one can hear his screams. His co-workers rush to the police. Please, you gotta believe this. But they don't buy the story they're told. Please, you gotta believe it's exactly thing. what the loggers feared. It took our friend. The emotional impact was still fresh in their faces, and you know, uh, some of them were still crying. The sheriff uh, knew something really serious had happened. Is that so? Yeah, it's the truth. But, but you don't, you don't think we had something to do with it? But he began to suspect that they had murdered me, that there had been some kind of a fight out there. Tell me the truth. No, we didn't do anything. It wasn't me. It, it wasn't us. And uh, that this was just the craziest cover story for a disappearance of a man. You know what? Why don't we just go to the station and let the lie detector find out? No, we were telling the truth. I, I swear I, to you. Okay, we're going to go find out. The sheriff brought in the uh, state police lie detector expert to test them and see if they had uh, murdered me and made up a crazy cover story. Meanwhile, Travis is fighting for his life. The overwhelming impression at the time was one of total fear, total threat. I needed to move and move quickly, and it wasn't working very well. The pain I felt I was centered in my head and chest. And it seemed to be a little bit associated with the uh, need to breathe, the impaired ability to get oxygen. And when my arm contacted this being, it felt much lighter and softer than I expected. They were pursuing me. They were reaching for me. Help! Help! Get away from me! He gets himself off the table, but the danger only escalates. I was just basically just out of my mind with fear, just screaming the whole time. Get away from me! I was backing away and screaming, threatening to keep him from coming any closer. Get away from me! Just screaming in fear and stay away! And it seemed to work. No! No, just stay away! I backed up and I bumped into a shelf with some instruments laid out there. I just grabbed the biggest thing I could find and started flailing through the air. No! I said stay away! Screaming threats to keep him from coming any closer. I'll tear it apart! It doesn't work for long. Stay away! I'll kill you! Stay back! I'll kill you! They uh, stopped and then the stare. Just momentarily, they were all three staring at me. 
And they had huge eyes. So this, I felt this penetrating gaze that was just, it just gave me a real squirmy feeling in my head. I've had over 40 years to think about why they look the way they look and why I reacted the way I reacted. I think that these beings, people claim that they have the ability to control people, mind control, telepathy, that maybe that's what that stare was doing. I, but for whatever reason, that stare, those, that gaze, I felt very uncomfortable. And that was the focus of my nightmares in the aftermath. It's been theorized that aliens possess the technology to use telekinesis or, or mind control. If an alien race is able to control the mind, they'll be able to control our thoughts. <laughs> They put this mask on my face. It's just like an oxygen mask. You had some kind of gas that uh, they were giving me. It didn't hurt. I just blacked out real quickly. Travis has been abducted by aliens. Stay back. And his feeble attempt at escape has failed. The Native Americans had uh, a, tr a long tradition of uh, interaction with what they called the Sky People, going back so far as to be depicted in these rock drawings, uh, petroglyphs. The ancient astronaut theory has been said to be able to go as far back as ancient Mesopotamia, the Sumerian or, or Babylonian times. Uh, everyone's been looking up. Every, uh, there, there is evidence of sky gods, people coming from the heavens down below. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years. Our ancestors believe we came from the sky and we haven't stopped looking since. With no sign of Travis, Police suspect his co-workers have killed him. Now, well, what have we here? Up here! Bring the shovel. A suspicion that deepens when they discover what could be a hastily dug grave. You know, it really doesn't make sense. Why would anybody make up that kind of a story? The reason that dogs could not find any trail leading away from the clearing is because I, I did not walk away from the clearing that I was taken aboard. There's nothing here. While the search for Travis continues, his terrible ordeal aboard the spaceship comes to a sudden end. consciousness I looked to see where the light was coming from but just as I turned to look uh, the light went out and then it would there was a the metallic reflective surface there that was unlit before it shot up into the sky the memory of the panic that I had been experienced in the face of these strange creatures, you know, was uppermost in my mind. Those little pieces of memory, they came back as kind of like dream fragments. But even though it was dark, there was a sense of relief that this was freedom. I recognized the stretch of road, been there many, many times, and I could see the lights of the town down below. And so I just ran in that direction. Try to get some help. And the first building I came to was lit. There was uh, steam or smoke coming out of the chimney. I pounded on the door and yelled, Help me! Help me! And if there was anybody in there, they didn't come. 
and maybe with good reason, you know, you hear somebody yelling that way in the middle of the night, you might not want to come to the door. So I ran on down, I came to some phone booths. Operator. And in uh, this part of the country at that time, you could just pick up the phone and talk to the operator and make a uh, phone call. So I didn't even have to put a dime in. And uh, I made a collect call. He calls his family, but he doesn't get the reaction he expects. Please, you gotta help me. Who is this? What do you want? My family were thinking that I'd been killed. It's me. And they've been getting all these prank calls and they were just fed up with it. And my brother thought this was another one. But I yelled, it's me, it really is me. And he, he understood then that this, you know, this was for real. And uh, so he says, I'll get your brother and come and get you. And I, I hung up, but uh, I must have collapsed. <laughs> taken home does Travis realize how long he's been missing I had no idea how much time had gone by my brother realized that I was thinking that this was still the same night and so he goes Travis you've been gone for five days and that was such a shock I had no idea about the, the crew going to the sheriff or this massive manhunt that went on for days. I knew nothing about, you know, my uh, family, you know, practically giving me up for dead. None of that. Uh, I just knew what I had experienced and the trauma of that. And I'd been trying to get it out. I couldn't finish a sentence. I was just so racked with fear. And, and that, that continued for some time. He was able to share his actual encounter with me. His story is, is, is incredible. To date, Travis Walton and the crew have taken 10 polygraph tests and have passed every single one. And they all believe that this has happened. Some say aliens have been visiting this planet for millennia. There's a core reality here that can't be denied. And Travis is not the only one who has driven into the woods and encountered mysterious beings from another world. Even looking back on it now, 17, 18 years later, I can't think of any explanation for what I saw. I, I can try and rationalize it every way I can and Nothing can explain what it was I witnessed that night. I still get a little creeped out thinking about it. In 1999, Richard Parks heads out for a camping trip, thinking it's just going to be a casual getaway with some buddies. I never had a feeling or sense about anything out of the ordinary at that campground before. It was always just a fun place to go and hang out. With, with friends and be outdoors. It had been two years since I had been to, to the campgrounds and I had uh, forgotten which turn that I needed to take to get to the campground. And so I, at one point I had to pull over and consult my map. Yeah, I must have missed a turn here somewhere. This is the spot. <sighs> Told you I knew where it was. After we arrived at our destination, we set up our camp, pitched our tents. When you've done that, you, why don't you grab some wood? We'll get, uh, we'll get that thing set up, huh? Boys, it's gonna be a good weekend. <sighs> 
Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Nothing struck me as, as odd until later on that night. All right, guys, that's it for me. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hitting this hay. Good night. That night after everyone had retired for the night, I got up. I had a strange urge to go walking. It probably wasn't the brightest idea in the world to go out, because I, I don't recall being armed other than a knife. I wasn't prepared for what I found as I hiked up that trail that night. Seeing a bear would have been less unnerving and would, would have definitely creeped me out a lot less than, than what I found. It did seem like something wanted me to go up the canyon, like I was probably being drawn up the canyon that night for whatever reason, I didn't know. I'd have to describe it as an uncontrollable restlessness, the need to go somewhere. A lot of alien encounter stories are, are accompanied by unexplained movements or unexplained wandering into unfamiliar areas in the middle of the night. Suddenly, Richard discovers he's been drawn into a mysterious part of the woods. It is common that uh, people are randomly activated through telekinesis, uh, mind control or, or, or telepathy. I had probably hiked for about a mile. The moon wasn't offering much light into the canyon. It was very dark, it was very still. It was really quiet. There didn't seem like there was even any nightlife going on at all. I cross a clearing off to my left of the trees that allowed me to see down into the canyon and I noticed as I was approaching the clearing that there was some light down in the canyon. I wasn't sure what I was seeing. It wasn't moving, it was just a steady glow. So almost like someone had built a, a fire in the canyon, but there was no flickering. It was just a steady glow. As I came into full view of the clearing, there were what, what appeared to be people down there, standing in a circle. There were two pairs facing each other. They're wearing dark robes, full length with hoods. The beings standing facing each other with their arms outstretched above them to kind of form like a Y shape with their body. The thoughts going through my mind as I'm seeing this is I've stumbled across some form of ritual or another. Yet he soon realizes that this is something even more bizarre and terrifying and that the figures before him aren't people but entities not of this world. The glow that I was seeing surrounding their outstretched hands and then forming a beam stretching above their heads. It may be some sort of a power or energy source. It may actually have properties that is drawing the individual towards it. Upon approaching them, I didn't feel like I was in any kind of danger. I wasn't really scared. 
I couldn't see any faces in the hoods. The glow that they had down there was illuminating everything they were doing, but I saw no faces. Richard feels he is safe as long as they don't see him. But they do. A mysterious force drew Richard Parks from his tent to a clearing in a canyon. It appears as if this gentleman was activated or, or led and lured to a specific spot away from the camp. And he's been led to where extraterrestrial beings are performing a strange ritual. I saw the being's hood tilt up towards me. And after a moment or two, all three of the others turned towards me. And that's when I realized that they all knew I was there. I remember the feeling of danger that overcame me. Being there in that situation with nothing but a blade on me probably contributed to the feeling of fright that I had been overcome with upon being noticed. Their attention was now on me. But Richard can't seem to find the will to move, let alone reach for his knife. I, I couldn't go anywhere. If the notion had occurred to me to run, I wasn't able to. I couldn't really tell if it was them holding me in place or if it was the fear holding me in place. It was like a silent horror film. <laughs> Then everything went black. When I woke up that morning, I was partially clothed. I didn't have my boots on, I didn't have my shirt on, but I still had my jeans on. It seemed strange because I didn't remember taking anything off. I couldn't remember hiking down the canyon. I couldn't remember coming back into the campground. I didn't remember getting into my sleeping bag. I couldn't remember any part of the trip back. I felt like the things that I had seen could have been responsible for putting me back and making me forget. But at the same time, it, it didn't make sense because why would I still remember them? If their hands were like this, this big light. I had told the, the two friends that I had come up with what happened during the night, and we all kind of got thoroughly creeped out by it. Whether they believed me or not, it was never apparent, but it creeped them out enough, and, and myself, that we, we didn't even stick around for breakfast. We took down our tents, packed up our supplies, got in the truck and left. I look back at what happened that night every once in a while as I'm flipping through old drawings and old books that I kept over the years. Nothing can explain what it was I witnessed that night, aside from some form of ritual that I had stumbled upon. Those who have encountered entities from out of this world Never forget the experience, as Travis Walton knows all too well. The recovery process was very slow, and, you know, every night was a nightmare. Of returning to the vision of those eyes staring, boring into me. It slowly, very slowly, it took years. It was very hard to deal with, very hard to cope with. Is there any ongoing sort of thing? Are they gonna come back? You know, that's a very haunting feeling. 
When it comes to alien encounters and experiencers, it's easily comparable to post-traumatic stress. Uh, it's equivalent to, to a soldier who's come home from war. It's traumatizing. This really does happen. It's real. And it's been a long, slow process adapting to try to make uh, just surviving it become something more positive if I can. The town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia is postcard pretty on the outside. But years ago, a devastating tragedy shook its residents to the core. The Silver Bridge uh, was, was a bridge spanning from Point Pleasant to Canalga, Ohio. Uh, it collapsed on uh, December 15, 1967. It was the worst bridge disaster in U.S. history, claimed 46 lives. This was just a huge, traumatic event for the small town. I was right in the middle of it when it happened. I was five years old in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. At the time, a mysterious creature was seen clinging to the bridge. Because of its expansive wings and insect-like appearance, it became known as the Mothman. There were people that, that claimed they seen it flying around some of the towers of the, of the bridge a few days before the, the bridge collapsed. People thought that this creature caused the, the collapse of the bridge. There were over a uh, hundred reported sightings to the authorities. My guess is there were probably hundreds more who never reported anything because they were afraid of being called crazy. There are those that think the Mothman itself is a harbinger of doom. The Mothman sightings in 1966 started a gigantic surge of media coverage and a lot of curious people who descended on Point Pleasant to, to get a glimpse of this creature for themselves. You know, there were people driving around with, with rifles and guns. The military and the, and the police did come in and uh, quarantine that area off. This, this brought a lot of theories that there was a cover-up. The fear still is out there. These days, this legendary being is said to haunt the woods outside of Point Pleasant. It's a perfect environment, it still is. It's desolate, it's very eerie, it's, it's dead silent. Nothing has really changed in the 60, 70 years. It's a very scary place to be. In 2008, Jeff and Crystal Drenning head out to the area for a little getaway. When we went on this trip, we thought we were just going for a day trip, something different. I had no idea it would change our lives like this. I entirely regret it. I, I wish we would have gone anywhere else but Point Pleasant. We were in retail uh, management at the time, and it was few and far between that we had weekends off together. So one came up, and we decided it was within driving distance. We, we wanted to head out to that area. So if we keep going down... A casual street. stop for directions changes their destiny. Okay. Okay. The man started talking to us and explained these stories. So that'll bring us to the bunker? As he was telling us this, you know, I, I thought it was pretty cool. It was neat, something different. So he just drew us a map where there was a lot of paranormal activity reported. Thank you so much cool. for your help. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Crystal and I always always shared a, just a brief interest in the paranormal. Uh, I mean, we didn't really put much stock into it. But upon being alerted to Mothman's stalking grounds, they find the lure irresistible. Just gonna go straight ahead. We decided to just give it a shot. You know, it'd be like a little adventure following the little little map he drew us, treasure hunt kind of deal. This is it. If I had the opportunity to go back, no, there's there's right. there's absolutely nothing that would uh, get me to go out there. Is this it? I think so. Crystal and Jeff decide to make the most of the experience and return with proof of their adventure. Ready? We went just like to the local Walmart and got a digital voice recorder. That was the first time we tried anything like that. Ready? Yeah, this thing works. <laughs> this way? Sure. It did feel eerie, which we just attributed to the environment itself. Uh, 
I think this is the place. Do you have that recorder thing? Oh, yeah. Did you put the batteries in it? Yes, I did. <laughs> Do you want to work it? Can't record. Hello? Are you there? Can you hear me? If there's anything you want to tell us, this is your last chance. At the time, we audibly heard absolutely nothing. Let's go. Sure. And when we backed out, I didn't think anything happened. You know, I just chalked it up to uh, cross this little adventure off on the list and head back into town. I'll try and get some rest. When we got back home, we were just kind of waiting around to go out to eat. Did you get anything? So we just thought we'd waste some time and rewind the recorder and see what we got. Can you hear Are you me? ready? I'm ready. Are you there? Just on the off chance, I mean, it was more of an obligation. We took the time to ask the questions, go out there and actually do the session. Might as well give it a go, listen to what we recorded. If there's anything you want to tell us, this is your last chance. What? No, no, no. Let me see that. And then we heard this really deep voice just say, I'm here. Someone's messing with us. And uh, Did you mess I just blew my mind. Like, it was like we almost went to like kind of a state of shock. We just were speechless just stared at each other. We blew our minds. We couldn't believe that we actually caught something on a recorder. If there's anything you want to tell us, this is your last chance. <laughs> what? It, it, it just takes you aback. Uh, it, was, it was really a deep, raspy, guttural voice. But, uh... It didn't sound like it, it, it should come from any humanoid vocal cords. I was not prepared for what was going to happen next. Hello? I thought it was just a computer or telemarketer or something like that. That was weird. What was it? You mm -hmm. But I quickly found out that it wasn't any of those things. <laughs> Jeff? A voice and it was definitely not human it was really strange I knew that something wasn't right we knew we're dealing with something that shouldn't exist let's go inside we knew 100% that whatever we picked up in Point Pleasant had followed us home Jeff and Crystal Drenning went into the woods to try and contact a legendary creature, the Mothman. If there's anything you want to tell us, this is your last chance. If you go in and mess with something like this, we have learned the hard way that you're almost opening a door. <laughs> now that they've conjured the entity, it won't leave them alone. People that, uh, you know, had encounters, you know, with this thing are never to be able to shake that feeling that there's something unexplainable that is 
still in their life. It won't go away, uh, a haunting, so to speak. Odd things started happening. We were getting ready to go out to dinner and I went into the bathroom just to touch up makeup or something like that. I went to grab the doorknob. <laughs> and the doorknob was just burning hot. And I pulled my hand back and there was like this dark black ashy substance on my fingers from where I touched the knob. I immediately thought, oh my gosh, something is on fire. Dad! yelled for me, so I go. And I touch the doorknob and it, it's it's burning hot. I mean, it, it's radiating heat from inside the doorknob. It's, it's literally hot to touch at the point where it blisters your hand. Crystal, are you okay? I thought there was a fire in the wall, possibly, with the wiring. I'm coming in! Okay. Stand back! All right. I, I'm, I'm looking around to make sure, you know, hey, there's no fire internally in the wall. There was nothing. No fire. Everything was completely normal. Jeff. We then opened up the back of the bathroom door. There's handprints on, on, on the back of the bathroom door. It was these elongated fingers, almost really skinny long fingers with, with the hand there. I mean, the hand's three or four times the size of mine. I mean, I'm a pretty big guy, and this is just, it, it, it dwarfs mine in comparison. And we see the handprints on the door, and it's like this, this ashen, sooty kind of uh, residue. And it's just two or three of them on the door. You could tell it, 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 was, it wasn't human. There's no way it was human. We realized pretty soon that the activity that we started to have was nothing compared to what we would end up having to deal with. When I was home alone, I was definitely on edge. It was looking over your shoulder, wondering if something's going to happen at any time and it takes a lot out of you to be constantly on edge like that Jeff, thought you were at work. She continues to talk to what she thought was me, and there's no response. And she saw a hand just press up against the shower curtain.
there's there's something there. It's not it's not something she imagined. I mean, she actually felt it. different things drawn there'd be like big handprints there'd be different symbols mainly like drawings of eyes and things like that the door was locked there's no way anybody else could come in and draw them it takes it to an entirely different level i mean your home is supposed to be your safe haven and it's now ground zero essentially I worked a closing shift. It was probably 10, 10 30 p.m. I was I was out in the middle of nowhere on this one stretch of highway. It's it's incredibly desolate. There's no there's no residences around or anything for probably 15, 20 miles. This was a road that I I had driven daily. Uh, I mean, to and from work. I I never noticed anything out of the ordinary prior to this. And I rounded a turn on the, on the road and just on the edge of my headlights. a silhouette of someone and I thought that that's kind of strange a hitchhiker out here in the middle of nowhere he's, he's, he's never going to catch a ride I mean he's, he's literally in the middle of nowhere hey as I approach him, I can see that this this wasn't a normally dressed person. Uh, I mean, they had a cloak on, like a hood. It draped all the way down to their ankles. Their hands were at their side. Do you ride or what? They had these really Hello? twitchy kind of movement to them. Can you get out of the way? This thing turned around it brought its forearm up to shield its eyes from the headlights. And the first thing that I noticed was this desiccated gray mottled looking skin on the hand. I mean, it, it, it almost looked decomposed. Then it brought its arm down see two eyes glowing and it wasn't like an animal's eyes when you shine a light on them they reflect back at you these were independently glowing uh, I mean it, it almost like it had its own light source so I'm completely awestruck this doesn't make sense to me and then it breaks the stillness of the whole situation. I let out this ear-piercing shriek. It looks almost like death, what you think death would look like. There's, there's something unexplainable than their life. It won't go away. This thing is just pure evil. The legendary Mothman has haunted the woods of West Virginia since the 1960s. Jeff and Crystal Drenning have crossed its path, and now it's stalking them. <laughs> They're seeing this thing and hearing it and encountering it over and over. It's terrifying to live with this. Your home is supposed to be a safe place to be, and you never know when something's going to happen. Jeff finds himself face to face with the blood curdling creature in the middle of nowhere. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around what is in front of me. It was really animalistic. The movement in itself is enough for me to know there's no way, shape, or form that was a human. 
closer to me. So immediately, I think, uh, you know, oh my God, what, would, what am I gonna do? when something was near. It was just, the air became just really thick. You could almost feel your lungs start to tighten up and your heart beating. It was almost as, just, as if it just surrounded you. itself physically uh, I mean that's that, that's an entirely different ball game it's terrifying uh, I mean you feel violated almost just something has breached your home but at the same time it's terrifying because I mean obviously this thing that isn't supposed to exist not only contacted you not only replied to what you said it's taken the the next step further and followed you home. We began to hear that voice, not only in recordings, but we would actually got to the point where we would hear it audibly. And every time I hear that voice, it's just complete dread. It just, this voice is just like pure evil. I would wonder, you know, what do you want? What do you want from us? No, he's here, he's here. We would actually hear things in a home, you know, just disembodied footsteps. As the activity grew stronger, it became more violent. that would come out of the cabinet and break silverware that would actually be thrown on the floor you could hear from the next room <laughs> the knocks on the wall <laughs> the phone calls the, the disembodied footsteps sometimes you hear voices as well in the next room garbled speech you couldn't really make out what it was saying but you could definitely tell that it was there <laughs> Pushed to the point of desperation, Crystal and Jeff returned to where their nightmare began. You ready? Yeah. We decided to go back just to try to get some answers. We just had enough. We got to a point where we were like, that's it. You know, this thing has followed us home, but we know that it came 
It attached itself to us in Point Pleasant, so we're going to go there to the source and just confront this once and for all. It was almost a last-ditch effort. It seemed like we didn't have anywhere else to turn. It was a completely different ball game than the first time. The first time that we went, we were just, you know, looking for some entertainment, having fun. This time we wanted to fight this thing down. When we crossed that threshold, it was almost like we could feel just this really ominous, suppressing type feeling. It was almost like something was closing in around you. This is it. Do you have the quarter? Do you have the quarter off? Yeah. Are you here? This time it was it was more along the lines of demanding answers. Tell us what you want! We've had enough! We were very frustrated. We were tired of it. What do you want from us? Just leave us alone! Crazy. Really? He's here. Say something! This this feeling continued to grow and grow. It was a feeling I can't even begin to explain. It was almost like you just wanted to jump out of your own body. We can't take it anymore! We know you're here! Come out! Finally, Jeff just told it. It's now or never! And after I had said, it's now or never, I gave it 10 or 15 seconds to answer. I didn't hear anything. I don't know. It was, it was like a freight train hit me. Something just hit him in the chest, and he just lifted up in the air and just went. Are you okay? I thought, this is it. I'm gonna die. There's, there's no doubt about it. He just looked up at me. His face was pure white, and he just said, run. What? what? Run! I jet as fast as I can. It literally felt like we were running for our lives at whatever this was. I thought we were done for. After months of torment, <laughs> Jeff and Crystal return to the site where they first encountered Mothman to beg for peace. <laughs> it doesn't work. Run! 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 Just know that an unseen force literally just assaulted me. So in my mind, it was run, get to the car, get out of here. I was pretty much in shock when we were running. I just, I thought that this was it, that it was going to kill us. The only thing going through my mind was just to get as far away as possible. I do regret going back. I don't know if it gave it 
any more, you know, energy. Despite the couple's attempt at a truce, Mothman won't let go of them. After we confronted this, it, it just felt like there was nothing that we can do. We felt hopeless. We didn't know if we just made it angry, so things are going to get worse. We just heard this extremely deep growl come from inside. We're leaving! Just let us go! Tristle, stop. Let's just go. Come on, get in the front. Get in the front. And we left. And we thought if we moved, everything was over. But it wasn't. For the Drennings, the terror doesn't end. Mothman follows them wherever they go. I think we definitely opened a doorway. There's no doubt about that. What came through it, I don't know. How to get rid of it. I don't know if it's gonna follow us for the rest of our lives or not. I, I really hope not, but I mean, it just seems like whatever we do, nothing gets rid of it. We've actually had a Catholic priest come to our house and bless it twice, but it just always comes back. So we just have to deal with it on a daily basis. But the question is, what exactly is Mothman? Some say the story goes back to a bloody chapter of West Virginia's history. Chief Cornstalk was a uh, Shawnee chief who was murdered over a land dispute. Him and his son both were actually murdered back in the 1700s. It was told over the years that Chief Cornstalk actually cursed the town of Point Pleasant in the form of a 200-year curse in revenge for him and his, his son's deaths. And exactly two centuries after the massacre, Mothman descends on Point Pleasant to wreak havoc. 200 years to the month, to the day, and to the year, that's when the bridge fell. Some contend Mothman is the personification of Chief Cornstalk's revenge. Others refute that claim, but most believe he is not of this world. There were some people who claimed this thing had biblical connotations. They thought that, you know, this, this thing was just pure evil, period. So I don't know if anybody will ever be able to, to have, a, have a direct answer. Whatever the origin, the legend persists. And even after taking 46 lives, Mothman still stalks the area. Few are foolish enough to go looking for him. And those who do often suffer the consequences. My brother wanted to try to find the Mothman. Faye DeWitt and her brother Topper's encounter takes place even before the horrific bridge collapse. The Bug Man of Virginia. That's, uh, that's real spooky. What do you think it eats? Maybe it eats people. Oh, God. Maybe it uh, uses its mothy proboscis to drink them dry from the inside out. Really, Topper? It was my brother's big idea to go up there and try to find it. He was going to prove that that was a fake because he was a very skeptical person, a very smart person to the point that he, you know, he didn't think nobody knew anything but him. And he was going to prove the Mothman was a fake and that was his intent of going up there. Well, what if we actually see it? Then what are you going to do? You're going to eat your words. That's what you're going to do. I'll, I'll go out and shake hands with it and try to look for the zipper. How about that? I don't know why you made me do this. See anything? Nothing public.
Auto ist schon mal. Did you see that? I thought, oh, what is it? You see what? Nothing. I saw it plain as day. What does it look like? It was just a deer or something. It wasn't a deer. Big deer? So stupid. So, which way? This was your idea, not mine. What? Don't turn around. Why? My brother just kept looking at me. He said, don't look, there's something there beside the window. No. In my peripheral vision, I could see it there beside me, even though I was looking straight ahead. And I told him, what we're gonna do, what we're gonna do. Did you see that? There are a lot of people who go looking for this creature and, you know, playing it off as, as uh, you know, maybe just some fun. But uh, once they encountered it themselves, you know, I think they changed their tune. Faye DeWitt and her brother Topper head out to prove that Mothman, the mythical being haunting the woods of Point Pleasant, is a hoax. They find out the hard way that it's not. I got scared the minute I turned my head and saw that thing beside the window. It had like rubbery type skin like on him and long fingers, long, curly nails on. I mean, like you would see on a hawk or a bird. But if one thing stands out, the eyes is what caught you. You're focused on that, and that's what those eyes did. The Mothman definitely has a, uh, a way of uh, hypnotizing. I would say just about everyone who, who witnessed this, this creature talked about how they were almost paralyzed by, you know, these two red eyes. We were just scared to move, afraid if we moved, it might try to come in the car. Go. Go! turn he thought he was going to throw him when we made the turn but he didn't we were going down the road like a racetrack and it seemed to be right beside the window there he was trying to speed up and lose it and it just was right there by the side of the window just like nothing, like it was no effort whatsoever. No! What? We'll get trapped in there! And he made that turn to the loading dock where they would fill the trucks up. And I said, don't go in there. Then how are we going to get out? It'll have us pent. Where'd he go? Maybe we lost him. And when he did that... <laughs> He crouched kind of like a squat position, looking at me and my brother. And we just drew back and tried to be real quiet and don't move. And I told him, what we're going to do, what we're going to do. It jumped off the car. 
It landed just a few feet away. And it crunched down just like it did in the car and watched us crouch like a gargoyle. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Top her! What are you doing? Hey! Get out of here! Hey! He was taking up chunks of coal, throwing it at her. Get out of here! Top her, get back here! And I was hitting him, telling him, get in here, leave it alone, let's get out of here. Yes. And it stood up. Now you're gonna make it mad. mad. It's gonna come and get us. It's gonna come and get us. My brother said, Don't move, don't move. I said, Okay, okay. What's it gonna do? What's it gonna do? Faye and Topper go looking for a creature they think is a hoax. Did you see that? Until they find it. <laughs> Now they are trapped on the road, facing the living nightmare that is Mothman. Topper, get back here! I saw its wings, cause it just opened it up, just as pretty as an angel or any bird. And it was beautiful, I mean, just, it was like seeing an angel in a way, because of those wings, big enough to carry a human being, it was beautiful. Beautiful and terrifying. It ran, and I thought, sure, it was coming after us. It just flew off and off it went. But it was just amazing to see something like that, but we were scared. I told my brother, we need to get out of here and get home because it might come back. So he turned around, whipped around, and we went home. That was it, and then the bridge fell, I guess, not long after that. The siblings never see Mothman again. I had a lot of things in my life happen that was scary. Uh, that was really more scary and life threatening. Though it let Faye and Topper go, Jeff and Crystal aren't as lucky. Mothman continues to terrorize them. We've been dealing with it for eight years. We have no idea why it chose us, but it did. It's almost like it's just there to torture us. This did happen. After nearly a decade, I don't think it's ever going to leave. It's all too real. You need to take precautions.